In this lecture, we'll discuss regression discontinuity design. We have been studying experimental studies, but we're going to now shift our focus to observational studies. In many cases, we can't simply um, conduct randomized trials. For um, ethical reasons, it might not be possible to randomize the treatment assignment. And for logistical reasons, that may not be possible. Um, but there are a lot of important questions in social sciences in particular that demand uh, empirical evidence, even when we cannot uh, randomize the treatment assignments. So we cannot just give up um, studying something just because we cannot randomize the treatment assignment. And plus, as we discussed, there are a lot of advantages of the observational studies in particular um, in terms of external validity. One thing that's important, though, is that uh, in observational studies, because units can select themselves into uh, treatment and control groups, it is important to think about designing um, observational studies in, in that we want to find a setting where a credible co causal inference is possible. We can um, make a credible assumptions and uh, estimate the causal effects. Um, since we observational studies by construction, researchers cannot intervene or um, so we have to find the setting where such uh, credible causal inference is possible. And what's important, and this is something we all need to remember, uh, is that one disadvantage of observational studies relative to experimental studies is that we don't have a control over who gets uh, treatment assignment. What that means is in observational studies, we need to find a setting where we have some knowledge, um, hopefully um, really good knowledge, of treatment assignment mechanism. Uh, so even though units are um, themselves self-selecting into the treatment assignment or some other unit, um, some other people are assigning uh, everybody to treatment and control groups, we want to find a setting where the treatment assignment mechanism is known to the researcher. When you find that such a setting, we have much better chance um, of drawing the credible causal inference. One very important uh, design, such design, is, is called regression discontinuity design, or RD design. In the sharp RD design, which I'll discuss uh, in this lecture, uh, the treatment assignment is based on the deterministic rule. And that rule is known to the researcher. So this is extreme um, setting where we have full knowledge of the treatment assignment mechanism. Even though we have no control over who gets the treatment, but we know how the treatment is assigned. And it's an actually deterministic rule in, um, as opposed to some probabilistic rule. We're also going to study this uh, in this module, uh, fuzzy RD design, where the encouragement to receive treatment is based on the deterministic rule, as opposed to the treatment assignment itself. And you can already probably see that uh, we may use some instrumental variable techniques here to analyze such a design. This uh, RD design originates from a study of the effect of scholarships on students' um, career plans that's going back to the 1960s in educational studies. And recently, have been um, becoming a lot popular in, in social sciences. Okay, let's start look at the details of RD identification, RD design identification. The estimate, the causal quantity that we would like to estimate is the average treatment effect at the threshold, xi equals c. So conditional on xi equals c, what is the average treatment effect? In the figure, this represents the, uh, this is represented by the green line. The gap between y of 1 and y of 0, mean, mean of y of 1 and mean of y of 0 at the threshold 0 0.5 in this case. Okay. So what is the assumption that, uh, that's required to identify this quantity? The key assumption is that conditional expectation of the potential outcome, y of t, in, is continuous in the forcing variable x for both t equals 0 and t equals 1. Intuitively, what this means is that nothing else that matters to the potential outcomes is going on at the x equal, xi equals c. So that the threshold, there is no gap uh, in the line, conditional expectation line of y of zero, 1 and as well as y of 0. Uh, 
So in the figure, you see that black line, which is the identifiable quantity for on the right, you observe the, the, the observation on the right are the treated observations. So you observe y of 1. So we can identify the mean of y of 1 given x. So that's the black line. And that line extends to the left, but it's in the dotted red line. That indicates it's not observable, it's not identifiable. So there's nothing, there's no gap. When you go from the black line to the um, red dotted line, crossing the threshold. Right, so that's what the continuity means. The same, same thing applies to y of 0 line. The y of 0 is observed on the left side, left side of observations, because that's the control observations. So we can identify the average uh, condition expectation of y of 0 given x democratic vote share. Uh, however, as we cross the threshold 0.5, we can no longer observe y of 0. So uh, that's indicated by the blue uh, dotted line. However, the assumption is that there's no, uh, there's no gap. Uh, there's no vertical gap uh, when you cross from the left to the right. Okay, so that's what, uh, what means continuous. And this assumption allows you the difference between y of 1 and y of 0, which is the green line, attributable, that, that is attributable to the difference in the treatment. If there's something else going on other than winning the election, when the vote share is 0.5, then that difference may not be um, due to the victory, electoral victory. It could be due to something else. So the continuity assumption says that um, the potential outcomes uh, smoothly changes uh, from left to right, and there's no, nothing, not, no other factor that matters to the outcome happens at the threshold 0.05. Um, so what's interesting about this is that the treatment assignment is completely deterministic. So above the 0.5, everybody is going to get treated. And then below the 0.5, uh, nobody is going to be treated. Okay. And this is uh, actually a violation of the overlap assumption. Uh, the usual assumption that we'll study later in observational studies is that Everybody uh, has a probability of non-zero probability of receiving the treatment and non-zero probability of receiving the control conditions. So there is some probabilistic assignment. There's some haphazardness is going on in the treatment assignment uh, condition on the bunch of confounders X. But in, in the case of RD design, the treatment assignment is de deterministic, not probabilistic. Okay. Uh, so what that means is that everybody on the right is going to be treated. So y of 0 is not observed at all for all observations in, on the right side of the uh, threshold. And what, similarly, y of 1 is not observed for all observations uh, on the left side of the threshold. Um, so RD design is really based on extrapolation. And estimate at the threshold is just a tiny bit of extrapolation. Uh, it's going to be happening because almost likely that the no election is exactly tied, although there's one such uh, election, congressional election, a few years ago. Um, so there are some observations that are very, very close to 0.5, the vote share being 0.5, but there's no, um, uh, you know, very few observations are exactly on the threshold. So we are extrapolating from both sides a little bit. Um, and beyond that threshold, it will be a complete extrapolation because uh, the treatment effect at the other parts of the uh, other parts of the graph would be decided by the, uh, the black uh, solid line, which is identifiable, and the dashed lines, the difference between those two lines. The dashed lines are the ones that uh, you can identify because there's no observations um, in, that, in that region. Okay, so we have to th sort of think about how much we are willing to extrapolate, and um, the assumption only allows you to identify the average treatment effect at the threshold. Okay, so clearly, the advantage of our de um, design is the internal validity. So as long as we know that uh, there is a deterministic treatment assignment, 
and we know exactly what that rule is. And we can assume that uh, conditional expectation of the potential outcome is continuous, nothing else is going on at 0.5. Then we can say that the, uh, we can estimate this average shooting effect at the threshold with, uh, with you know, credit, we can do, obtain a credible estimate of, of the quantity that we're interested in. However, the disadvantage is clearly the external validity because this uh, estimate is only applicable at um, exactly 0.5. So it's like, what would, what would be the achievement effect if there was a tie deduction? Yeah. And as we generalize this quantity farther away from the threshold, you know, um, that rely, that's gonna have to rely on extrapolation since we're gonna start using the parts of the data, uh, uh, data that, that uh, there's no observation that's available. Okay. So there's a usual trade-off between the external and the internal validity. In this case, it's, it's extreme, um, extreme uh, trade-off because there's a lot of emphasis on the internal validity, but the actual quantity that you're estimating is, is only narrowly applicable. Okay, so once we make this continuity assumption, how are we going to uh, estimate the uh, average shooting effect at the threshold? Well, we basically run two regressions, one from the above and the other from, the, from below. Okay. Uh, so first, we take the Chile group uh, and regress observed outcome y because we observe y of 1 and, uh, and we regress that on the forcing variable x. And then we take a limit to the threshold. So that basically uh, essentially means that you estimate that conditional expectation function and then extrapolate it at, to the threshold. We do the same thing for the control group. Uh, we observe y of 0. Hence, uh, we can regress y of 0 on x, the forcing variable. And then from the below, you're going to extrapolate right up at the, uh, to the threshold and then take a difference between these two quantity, which will give you the estimated average streaming effect at the threshold. Okay. The most um, standard way of doing this is to run simple linear regression. So you simply regress y on x. Usually you uh, subtract the threshold so that alpha estimate of alpha intercept um, is going to be uh, the, the estimate at the threshold. And then you do that um, for both uh, from the above and from below. And we, we take some window, okay? We take some window. Uh, we, don't, we don't use the entire observation typically. And we use um, you know, small window around the threshold and then run the simple regression. Um, so in the, in the case of cross selections, typically uh, researchers would, would take say plus minus two percentage point uh, window, and then run the uh, simple regre linear regression within each, each window. Okay. Um, you can run two separate regressions like I described, or one a single regression with four interactions. It's the same thing, but you can um, run four regression interaction, interacting with the trimming and the control group. So you have two intercept estimating um, separately. Now the question is, how should we choose a window uh, in the principal way? So as I said, often researchers would pick, say, plus minus two percentage point, but the estimate is going to depend on how wide that window is going to be around the threshold. So it's important to think about um, how, how, what the window size should be. Um, the other thing is that we may be worried about whether um, simple linear regression um, is a you know is a good sort of linear approximation is a, uh, is appropriate so you might want to use some kind of non parametric regression to to allow for the flexible um, functional forms now you might think that uh, higher order polynomial regression so in including the square term or cubic term or um, uh, of the forcing variable might be a good idea in fact, the figure that I showed you earlier may look like a, a fitting uh, 
polynomial regression using the entire data, but it turns out that's a bad idea because it's turn it it tends to be sensitive to the outliers. So if if the observations uh, out away from the threshold is very very extreme, that end up influencing the estimate at the threshold, and also it's it's often sensitive to the degree of polynomial. So, so how many degrees, whether you include the cubic term or even the higher order terms, it's going to change your results quite a bit. So we tend to avoid um, the approach of using the higher order polynomial regression, uh, fitting that to the entire data. And instead, we try to figure out um, uh, the, the choice of the window and try to figure out the uh, fit in a more flexible form of regression. So the standard approach uh, to RD design is usually we're going to use uh, something called local linear regression. So local linear regression is known to have a better behavior at the boundary than other non-parametric regression such as kernel regression. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, remember that we're trying to fit the two regressions, one on a treatment group and one on a control group. And using the, each of these regressions and estimate at the point at the boundary. Okay. So the challenge is that because there is no other observation on the other side, we want to use a method that estimates, uh, minimizes the bias at the, at the boundary point. And it turns out that local linear regression has that nice property. So what is local linear regression? It turns out it's just a weighted least squares regression instead of um, just a simple least squares. And as you can see, there are two regressions, one for the treatment group and one for the control group. I'm going to use alpha hat and beta hat as a least squares estimate, plus or minus represents the one from the treatment group and one from the control, control group. So it's exactly the same regression that we have and x is uh, standardized by subtracting the threshold c so that when the x equal to c, when you're predicting at the threshold, then the, you don't have to worry about the beta and your estimate is going to be half a hat. Okay, so that's basically um, the least squares uh, regression here. Now the weights are represented by something called a kernel. Okay, and the kernel is a function of xi minus c, so the distance from the um, from the threshold of the each observation and h, uh, which is called the bandwidth. Okay, and so each observation is going to have a weight, um, which is a function of the distance from the threshold x i minus c and the bandwidth h. And so there's different choice of kernel. Uh, one uh, one typical one is something called the uniform kernel. So uniform kernel um, basically get everybody gets the same um, same weight uh, regardless of the distance from the uh, threshold, and uh, at one at some point the weights become zero. So this is equivalent to just a subsetting, and then running the simple regression. So if I you know subset the data uh, plus minus one, and um, run simple linear regression then the red line is that that's basically the uniform kernel. Everybody gets the same weight within the 1 and minus 1, and um, everybody else gets zero weight. So that gets excluded from the analysis. Blue line, on the other hand, would, have, uh, would be the case where if I chop off plus minus point, point 0.5, uh, everybody within the uh, plus minus point 0.5 thresh, from the threshold would uh, receive the same weight, and um, all the observations outside of that threshold would get um, zero weight. Okay, so the uniform kernel, although it has a fancy name, it's the same thing as a uh, subsetting. And the H represents how how big that thresh, uh, uh, you know, how big that window should be. And so the larger the H is, the the more observation will be included. Alternative is something called the triangular kernel, uh, which looks like a triangle. So this, um, eventually the weight goes to zero like the uniform kernel, but within the window uh, H, you, uh, you give uh, greater weight to the observations that are closer to the threshold. Um, 
and uh, I've um, given you, you know, red and blue to two triangular kernels depending on H. So um, the 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 red one represents, you know, the, you're going to subset the observations plus or minus uh, one from the threshold, and then uh, drop all the observations outside of that window. And inside of the window, um, the observations that are close to the threshold get the higher weight. And then you can do the same thing for the blue, um, using the blue triangular kernel, where um, the smaller number of observations are included in the, in the analysis, but the greater weights are given to the observations that are close to the threshold. Okay, so basically this is the local linear regression. Uh, it's a quite intuitive. And um, it has a property of, um, you know, having uh, the smaller uh, bias at the, at the boundary. Now the question for this um, technique though is what's the choice of H, right? Because if the H is infinity, then basically that's same as running the linear regression on the entire data set. So the, if the window is, um, is, you know, is arbitrarily large, then it's the same as global regression. Um, and so the key question is uh, how, how small H should be. And uh, so there's important work uh, that's been done last um, eight, eight years or so. Uh, it's called the optimal bandwidth. So we're going to choose this bandwidth parameter H such that uh, we can minimize the uh, mean square error of the estimate. So here the mean square error is the estimated effect is the difference between the two intercepts from two regressions. And the true effect is obviously the a true version of alpha plus minus alpha minus. So that square and then taking the average is the mean square uh, conditional. Everything is conditional on uh, the threshold x, uh, the, the forcing variable x. And we can uh, rewrite this into uh, with some algebra mean square error. So we just um, you know arrange the alpha hat plus minus alpha hat plus um, minus uh, alpha hat minus uh, minus alpha minus. Okay, so we can just sort of separate it out and then square it and rearrange it a little bit. And you can you can get basically the MSE of alpha hat plus plus MSE of alpha uh, hat minus times the bias for the uh, treatment group intercept and the bi uh, times the bias of the control group intercept. Okay. And then you can do further uh, simplification to get um, the bias variance of decomposition. So it turns out the mean square error of the estimated average treatment effect can be decomposed uh, as the sum of the squared bias difference for the treatment group and the control group intercept, and the variance of the treatment group and the variance of the control group. One thing you notice is that bias might cancel out, right? So the bias of the treatment group and the bias of the uh, control group may cancel out. For example, if both are positively biased, then since you're taking a difference, um, actually those two positive biases may cancel out. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit different from just the estimating each intercept separately. And so what we sort of might think is that um, there's at least a possibility that the mean square error is dominated by the, by the variance. Um, and uh, there are methods out there that sort of try to use the asymptotic approximation to this mean square error and to find the bandwidth that minimizes this mean square error. Um, using the sum of the results from the local linear regression literature. And there's also important refinements um, using the bias correction to get the better confidence interval coverage uh, that was published subsequently after um, the original article.